here now with Sam Hudson, Corn Belt Marketing. Sam, it looked like the market was caught off guard a little bit this morning when USDA announced an historic buy from China when it comes to corn. How big was it? And, and was the market a little shocked? I think the market was a little taken a, you know, aback by it, you know, in the sense that we've been talking about the situation for Ukraine. You were coming out of a weekend, uh, maybe a little to sleep a little bit. Uh, but the purchase has been rumored for you know 30 or 45 days about China potentially doing some corn business. So uh, in terms of the size, you know, a little over a million metric tons, I think most of that was uh, was going to be for the old crop marketing year, uh, some up for the new. And when you look at it total from a flash sale standpoint, uh, not super impressive in terms of how it stacks up to, you know, historic, uh, you know, Chinese purchases, but the largest we've seen since May of last year, uh, and, and probably as symbolic as anything, uh, given the timing, uh, I think a lot of people suspect that this could be just the beginning of a trend potentially of them trying to fill some of the uh, lost Black Sea, uh, you know, supplies uh, due to the Ukrainian conflict. Yes, yeah, so that was my next question. Do you think this is just a start? You know, what's the reason behind these buys? But it sounds like it's just concerns over what will actually be produced in Ukraine? That's correct. Not, not only produced, but exported out of that region. You know, uh, of course, today there's been a little bit more chatter about the potential for the ports even being damaged. And if you damage infrastructure, that puts more of a definitive timeline on you know, the lack of that uh, supply being out there. Now, when you look at the Brazil second crop coming online, the fact that they've got pretty high potential there, I think the U.S. and Brazil can, you know, together can, can feed this demand, but just needs to be uh, kind of realigned here. And, uh, you know, China's been in our market for soybeans quite actively, regularly, steadily. Uh, so the fact that they're in here for corn now, uh, maybe, you know, continue to kind of stoke those uh, at least thoughts in terms of this being a longer term stance. Now, we've been talking about how the unfortunate situation in Ukraine, how this could cause a realignment of world trade. And so as we see this play out, you know, in our markets right now, does USDA, do you think they have penciled in the right number when it comes to demand from China at this point? You know, <laughs> Put in, fill in China, fill in anybody for that matter. I think, you know, what's unfortunate about the situation is we see a lot of this happening on the backs of a lot of Ukrainian lives, unfortunately. Uh, but where we land in this thing, I think, is such a question mark. I don't know how dramatic they can get until we actually see how some of it you know, plays out. Uh, you know, this Chinese purchase is, is certainly significant from our standpoint because we don't see this real often. Uh, could be, you know, the changing of a trend. But I think it also just underscores our current environment here uh, where the potential for raw materials, the desire for them, the need for them could exceed morality. Uh, and obviously, there's not much of that going on in Russia right now. But I think that theme uh, is, is a little scary at times, especially when you know, the, uh, the potential for uh, Russia being paid in rubles is out there for some of their raw commodities. And the fact that that helps prop them up and support uh, and potentially elongate this conflict and at least give them you know, a chance to, to you know, do it for a longer period of time. At the same time, coming off USDA's prospective plantings report late last week that showed farmers aren't planting more corn. Farmers actually intend to plant 4% less acres this year than they did last year. So if China continues to come to the market for corn, if we see yields under pressure in that Western Corn Belt because of dryness, especially in the Plains and, and, and the South, you know, what type of dynamic scenario does this possibly set up for this corn market, Sam? Well, and that's another thing that's peculiar about this, this Chinese sales. It comes on the heels of that. And, you know, things were already going to be kind of snug going into this, uh, this crop here. But the fact that, uh, you know, we've printed 89.5 million acres now, there's very little breathing room. So and maybe this is all also a signal that they're trying to get ahead of any potential problems in the spring. Uh, and that's a whole nother talking point here, kind of, you know, from a spring standpoint, we're not going to be early around here. And I don't think we are very... Uh, very many places across the Corn Belt. If we are, as you mentioned, it could be in the Western Corn Belt. Uh, they're dry enough potentially, but we need to see some, uh, some stronger temperatures here over the next couple of weeks to get some confidence that we could see some, uh, some better seeding progress across the bulk of the Midwest by the end of April. Sam, last question. We're going to start getting uh, weekly crop progress reports from USDA. Sometimes those can add some fuel to the market. Sometimes they don't, and I know it's something we debate each and every year, but Sam, in a year like this where it seems like everyone is so on edge about what the supply and demand picture will look like, do you think that these weekly crop progress reports could provide a different kind of fuel this year? They certainly are, but potentially even more importantly, leading up to that is just the forecast, uh, you know, because that's going to help set the tone for the expectations for those reports. 
uh, and, you know, like I said, there, there's not many places where you're going to see an early spring this year. And so the fact that we've got low acreage already penciled in, if you get the notion here that we're also going to delay planting or throw some sort of, sort of, you know, 2019 worst case scenario on top of it, uh, where does 89 and a half get penciled down to before we go to June if we get into that situation? And, you know, to the nth degree here, it, it's only the fourth of, you know, first week of April here. And, uh, you know, you get the you know, new crop December corn market, you know, pushing the $7 mark. There's not a lot of volume in this trade either. And so when you get in a situation like that, there's not a lot to hold it back. You can get vacuums in the market and create an even more turbulent, more violent trade. I don't want to sound, make you sound too bullish too. I mean, there's always risk when it comes to the market. So real quick, Sam, you know, what is the risk at this point? Well, the risk is that, we, you know, we get this geopolitical situation that has fueled all of this buying, you know, we've funneled, you know, three to six months potentially worth of buying in a very short amount of time because of what's happened here. And I think we have to take the, you know, the fact that uh, we got war premium in the market and, and remember that uh, we got this bullish acreage number on top of things. But if this war, you know, starts to subside and all of a sudden we all realize that maybe eventually we are going to find those acres. Uh, I think that, you know, that you've got the risk that you could make an early season high or high in the, in the first half of the, of the year. Uh, and then be hoping for a weather problem down the road. And so as you get further along in the marketing year, I think the more certainty comes into play here as we get into May, as crops get in the ground, get emerged a month from now, I think things are gonna be a lot different in terms of uh, the risk, because at this point, I don't think anyone, the risk is doing too much and then not being able to get in the field. So uh, I think as long as guys have hedged up a little bit and, and protected some of these higher input costs, I think that's the main thing. Uh, but then you gotta be thinking on the forward curve too, because you know, we all know that inputs are a lagging indicator. When you look at the price of Roundup, herb, you know, just herbicide, just everything in general fuel uh, puts a lot of question marks into you know, these bankers' minds uh, you know, on top and uh, over the next 18 to 24 months.